Thank you very much. <coughs> Let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is uh, Agnes Urban. I'm a researcher of Mertik Media Monitor. It's a media policy think tank uh, here in Hungary. And uh, we will have a little bit complicated panel. Uh, the first participant will be Shan Shan Huang, uh, deputy ma mayor of uh, Taipei City. But uh, she will not be here. She sent a video message, a pre-recorded video message. Uh, so we will start uh, this this panel with this uh, with this video message, uh, and then uh, we will continue with uh, open discussion. But uh, it will be uh, so there are further complications. Uh, we have uh, two online participants. Gianluca Misuraka, he is uh, the founder and vice president of uh, Inspiring uh, Futures. And uh, the other online participant will be Jimmy Bartlett. Um, he is um, the author of uh, several books and um, he is the expert of uh, social media and uh, darknet and uh, he's the founder of uh, Center, Center for the Analysis of uh, Social Media. And uh, fortunately, George Tilesh uh, is here personally. Um, he is uh, the president of the uh, PHI Institute for Augmented uh, Intelligence in California, and uh, he is a well-known international uh, expert of uh, AI. Uh, so I hope it will be an interesting discussion, and uh, I hope it will be an open debate between the participants. I think it is uh, much more interesting uh, than uh, just answer the questions. So I ask you, uh, or virtual participants and George, uh, to react to each other. So let's start uh, with the pre-recorded video. Good morning, everyone. I'm Vivian Huang, the Deputy Mayor of Taipei City. At the end of 2019, Taiwan was close to the forefront of the emergent COVID-19 pandemic in mainland China. Our experience with the SARS pandemic in 2003, the formation of the National Surgical Mask Manufacturing Team, and the continual improvement of response system have enabled Taiwan and Taipei City to assist other countries through the sharing of the information and the resources. On this basis, Taipei City government has begun using social media as channels and the resources of this dissemination and communication. We have provided many explanatory guides and video conferences with numerous countries and cities to introduce this outstanding system. Allow me to explain our use of social media through the core aspects of images, photography, videos, articles, and live streaming. Taipei City government has created simple guides and topical images. The simple guides list the key point of the continually revised system and are published on the Taipei City government, Mayor Ke wen -Zhe and other senior officials and uh, municipal units social media pages, including those of Facebook, YouTube, in Instagram, Twitter, and uh, LinkedIn. Social media enable us to provide the most accurate and unmodified information to the public within a short time frame. Most of the topical images constitute photographs from events, inspections, and press conferences and are usually accompanied by brief captions and articles to enhance the description of the images. Every day, we deliver the key points of our pandemic prevention strategy 
of the current pandemic status of Taipei City to the public through text messages, informing people of the government response to the pandemic and claiming feelings of anxiety through bridging of the information gap. I also post my weekly at work update on Facebook that documents the pandemic prevention process reports, which received considerable feedback from the public. Mayor Kowenzer and I read the replies to the understand the public's concerns and reflect on what we must still accomplish. Our videos are divided into event records, government proclamation, and news commentary. Most of are uploaded to the social media platforms such as Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn are used to upload videos in foreign languages. In regards to event records, we re record preview event meetings and the preparation and event happening and the conclusions. Video recordings are an entire event may be divided into segments or broadcast on a bridge. Take the Taipei New Year's Eve Come Down Party, attended by tens of thousands of people each year, as an example. Because of the pandemic, we ask participants to wear masks, undergo body temperature measurement, register their names and refrain from eating or drinking. We used Taipei Pass and the Big Data to monitor and update the flow of people during the entire event in real time and identify and solve problems when necessary. Of course, all attendees were informed of the data collection procedure in advance. Following a designated period of time after this event, the system automatically delete the data to ensure to privacy of attendees' personal information. For government proclamation, we formally describe to the public the policies relevant to the pandemic and analyze their advantages and disadvantages step by step, such as the use of type A car, type A pass, and the mask vending machine. This enables people to easily understand the pivotal points of the policies that typically take the form of several written pages. When we broadcast pandemic-related information, some individuals and the media channels have aggravated social fear through broadcasting their public opinions. In response, I use video to comment on and uh, clarify false information. During this critical period, the virus is our common enemy. I employ social media to comprehensively present my standpoint and my definition, the justice to promote public crime. An article can be the center of information or a supplementary element to an image or video, according to the characteristics of different social media. We arrange images and videos in different combinations to effectively spread information to different groups. On Facebook, we write formal articles in density detail. On Instagram, we provide down-to-earth information for young people to quickly understand the policies and actions adopted by Taipei city government. I think the greatest benefit of using social media is the information timeliness, accuracy, and the interactivity. The use of our own social media enables us to provide timely 
on modified information to the public without intentional or unintentional paraphrasing errors and receive real-time feedback from people. It also allows us to be fully responsible for our own words. Finally, I would like to mention live streaming, which provides the most direct and instant means of information dissemination. This May, Taiwan was confronted with its most severe COVID-19 outbreak yet, with many diagnoses, cases of the unknown origin appear in Taipei City. Following a consensus between us and the new media, Taipei City government and the SNG Association assumed the role of the signal providers, allowing only the video recording staff of the city government and one specific television channel on site. Only representatives appointed to reporters or sports people are permitted to raise questions, thereby controlling the number of people at the press conference. In addition to the news media, we live stream this video on Facebook, YouTube, and the Mayor Coast City's government's pages, furnishing the public with the most immediate information. Critical information is added into essential segments before being um, uploaded to the social media. These social media services provided by Taipei city government play critical roles in the timely, accurate, and interactive dissemination of information on pandemic prevention. Social media provides us with an effective platform with the which of communicate with the public and enhance the effectiveness and the pandemic prevention. Thank you again for your attention. I, Deputy Mayor Vivian Huang of Taipei City, wish you and your loved ones safety, healthy, and happiness. Uh, thank you to Shan Shan Huang uh, for this uh, for this video message, and uh, hopefully our online participants are already here, and uh, I hope they can hear us. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Um, so uh, let's start uh, with. Uh, with the most basic question in this uh, in this topic, uh, and I turn to to our online participants uh, first. Uh, so my question is: uh, If you have to evaluate uh, the overall effects of uh, social media, uh, do you think is it more positive or more negative? Because of course there are pros and cons, and we know that opinions are divided, uh, but. What is your overall picture uh, about this um, this phenomenon? Let's start with uh, Gianluca. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and uh, well, thanks first of all for the invitation. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry I'm not there with you in Budapest. I would have really loved, but I I guess uh, these uh, hybrid uh, uh, let's say kind of conferences will be the the future for at least a few years. And uh, I'm just back from an event. Uh, maybe I'll tell you a bit later um, on this. Um, that is also related to what we are discussing today. Um, so uh, as I, I know by fame, uh, Jamie, I will leave him uh, to discuss about the negative aspects of, uh, of this. Uh, but um, uh, maybe I'll point uh, first of all to the positive aspects. Uh, although, of course, uh, uh, we have to be I mean, we are not naive. I think here the title itself of this session uh, uh, shows uh, that uh, the risks and the challenges of managing, the, let's say, the digital world uh, uh, are uh, many. Um, uh, and clearly, as uh, the, the mayor of Taipei already pointed out, uh, you know, the pandemic society in which uh, we are still living uh, is, um, and we will be 
probably for many for a long time in uh, is uh, uh, further accelerating aggravating this uh, this uh, problem but let me just uh, briefly because uh, uh, i fully agree on the fact that we should have a conversation uh, so the the i mean the the I've been working for many years uh, for the European Commission. I'm still working, uh, um, leading a, a project on um, on establishing an international outreach for uh, human-centric AI. Maybe I'll, I'll tell you something later. Uh, but um, uh, in the in the research activity I've been doing uh, to support uh, policy development, uh, we've been uh, using the foresight and uh, you know scenario development. Uh, and uh, over ten years ago, when we were looking at uh, you know the horizon 2030, uh, we saw that um, the positive uh, potential effects of uh, of social media and you know collaborative technology because clearly we know the potential that this technology can have uh, to open up the governance system so make a system government more transparent uh, you know providing information uh, co-creating and, and pro providing uh, let's say input from the citizens so the knowledge uh, uh, um, could be shared in real time and uh, we can monitor and uh, assess also the, the the effect and the impact of policies but on the other side, we also saw at the time a possible dystopian futures coming in, actually using these through manipulation in a negative way. We also anticipated, and we were not the only one, I'm sure, the potential risk of a pandemic that could come from Asia or other regions of the world. And somehow we were not anticipating and preventing these risks. Now, Exactly a year ago, before leaving the Commission, I did another exercise uh, with colleagues about uh, looking at the future even farther and 2040 horizon. And we still see uh, much of the risk further uh, aggravated, as I said. Uh, uh, but, and then uh, clearly we need to uh, pose ourselves a, a question about uh, how we want to uh, manage or, or try at least to govern if this um, I mean the digital world, and this clearly points us to the fact that uh, there are um, there is a trade-off between regulating and trying to uh, uh, you know uh, uh, anticipate the risk, but at the same time and uh, not uh, wanting to uh, reduce the innovation uh, that the, the 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 technology can actually bring it to. Uh, industry and society. And so in that sense, uh, I think, and there's, uh, especially as the, the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, demonstrated, uh, we are really in a situation where we need to, I mean, we are confronted to this, uh, to this uh, big challenge. Uh, so uh, I'm still an optimist to answer your question. I believe technology are changing uh, uh, the world uh, in a positive way, but we have to be careful because there are a lot of risks and uh, this is uh, shown by the fact that uh, i mean if we only look at the at the pandemic uh, for instance still uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, a lot of citizens that are not uh, uh, fully understanding the, the situation and there's uh, a lot of governments are taking advantage of this situation also perhaps to control uh, citizens so we really have to be um, you know also um, I would say proactive in uh, in addressing these issues and fighting. I would say these online uh, um, online distortion that could come from uh, the bad use of, of technology. So I will stop here for the moment so that colleagues can uh, can complement and, and maybe disagree also. Thank you, um, and Jamie. Yeah. Um... Thanks for inviting me. Sorry I couldn't be in Budapest. Um, probably my favourite city apart from London, especially those ruin bars that I went to last time. Brilliant. I miss those. I was glad to hear some optimism coming from um, Gianluca. So I'll take the other side, which is the, the, the problems. And I'll, I'll, only, I'll only be brief with these comments because I think fundamentally it's really quite simple. Rather than imagining social media as being necessarily a bad thing or necessarily designed to destroy our democracies, it's just a case of incompatibility. We have old analog systems, institutions, norms, behaviors that have been created for an analog age, representative, Western representative modern democracies. 
it takes a long time to build those up. And there are a lot of institutions around them that try to make them work imperfectly, of course, but that is what we have. Suddenly along comes a totally different, rapidly changing, borderless digital technology. And our rules and systems and norms aren't quite designed to work with them well. And I think that is the fundamental problem. So I don't complain about Mark Zuckerberg. I don't complain about Jeff Bezos because I don't think they're doing this on purpose. It's just a fundamental incompatibility. And I'll give you three quick things. There are many more where I think this plays out. The first is our ideal of a citizen in a representative democracy is a thoughtful, literate, well-read, well-informed individual. The problem with social media is that it, it is designed to make your attention span extremely short, to appeal to your more base emotions perhaps, to keep you glued to this little box as long as humanly possible for various economic reasons. And that doesn't really work very well with our ideal of a democratic citizen. Secondly, incomprehension. Democracies are designed really to make sure that citizens understand where power lays and hold that power to account. When you do not understand how technology actually works, how search engine algorithms actually work, how the information you're presented with has been designed, who's really behind it, how machine learning technologies that might increasingly determine the outcomes of your life work, it's very hard to hold that power to account. So incomprehension of the technologies that govern our lives, I think is also incompatible in some ways with um, a representative democracy. And finally, a simple thing like election laws. You know, we have laws that try imperfectly as they are to help ensure we have free and fair elections. And suddenly the way that elections are run, particularly the way adverts are run during elections, there aren't really any laws to govern that, which means not only is it possible to cheat, it's even easier to accuse everybody else of cheating because nobody really understands how the system works. All of those challenges though are solvable. We can fix them. We can update laws. We can update education systems. We can make, I imagine one day we're going to have ministries and, um, uh, and de departments responsible for analyzing algorithms and how they work and making sure citizens can understand them. I imagine we'll update our election laws sooner or later. We need to completely change how our education system works to focus far more on media literacy. But these things are possible. Democracies do evolve. But at the moment, I'm worried, I'm nervous because I think we're much slower than the speed of change. But that fundamentally is the challenge that I see. Thank you very much. We got uh, two different approaches. Uh, so please comment this, uh, this ideas. So when you asked me to uh, reply to a binary question, whether it was a net negative or a net positive, and you were using the expression social media, I was thinking about being controversial and saying, do you mean, uh, very sophisticated surveillance advertising systems with a byproduct of you know connecting people. So uh, I will let you decide whether I'm a pessimist or an optimist, but I think my stance is that I truly believe in the potential of creating one certain kind of social media that serves the cause of the public and, and serves as the platform for, for public dialogue. Uh, much along the ways that Jamie has expressed it around the current setup of social media, which are frankly advertising platforms. I don't think Mark Zuckerberg wanted to rule the world via Facebook. I think that, that the fact that social media platforms as they stand have arrived to the global scene and, and took one of the most powerful positions as vehicles of social dialogue is very much accidental and very much unneeded. I think that I'm, I'm one of the, I mean, you know, I'm a philosopher or a failed philosopher type saying uh, that I think we have reached the point that we have to go back to the drawing table, the drawing board, 
and and redesign social media and, and and design a certain type of social media that has that is not in inherent conflicts with democracy and the rules of democracy. Uh, so very much similar to what Jamie has expressed, there are certain parts of the current models that surround us, the current setup of social media. Part of it is the business model itself. Like, I don't think that any kind of advertising based business model can serve the public interest. Uh, in other terms, uh, you know, it's, it's artificial intelligence and the algorithmic economy and the obscurity and the pervasiveness of these technologies that are making the current setup of social media kind of a threat. And third, it's the exploitation either be, uh, either inside the boundaries of how social media platforms work, which is basically using a ruthless micro-targeting uh, in advertising, be it commercial or political, or the exploitation of data sets that we have probably experienced, all of us, in our political elections. So there are too many threats Power is concentrated in the hands of the very few. Uh, actually, if I can practice a little bit of uh, self-flagellation here, uh, about 11 years ago, I used to work for Microsoft, uh, and I was also heading a foundation for digital upskilling of the population, like mass upskilling. And at that time, even when social media platforms were very much on the rise, our curriculum and our imagination at that time were basically restrained by only teaching user skills. And we didn't even get very far uh, in, in that regard. I, I think that, you know, when I think back to those times, I feel most responsible for not including social media literacy and critical thinking in that curriculum. So I would definitely change that if I would start a similar program today. Because we are in Hungary, I wanted to quote a few uh, points of data. Uh, and so Hungary, uh, as I've just learned a few weeks ago, is actually topping Europe or leading Europe in, in the regard of social media usage, everyday usage, and you know, watching YouTube videos using Facebook. Uh, and also, I think in video calls, we are number one in Europe. However, the understanding of these technologies the skills that you need to, to actually use them and protect yourself from the negative aspects of it, as much as you know, the work-related skills or, or strategic skills on how to apply technology to solve social problems, it's completely missing. And actually, Hungary is getting worse and worse in, in, uh, on these charts. So I think that that's, that's a threat, not just in Hungary, but in, in general in the world, that we are due to the due to the algorithmic economy we are all prone to becoming uh, something like an uh, existing on an autopilot mode living in this stream of consciousness expressed in social media that is not ours that serves the interests of the you know the advertiser or the platform owner only and certainly not ours i don't think anybody wanted to get on social media to buy something but you inevitably will do so if you spend a lot of time on it. So basically, it's time to rethink the models fundamentally. And, and I want to close with that thought that I think that a certain type of social media needs to be created. It's inevitable, uh, but it needs a completed fundamental redesign of the purpose and the objectives of such a technological solution. Thank you very much. Uh, and you mentioned uh, the users uh, and the responsibility of the users and the importance of education. Uh, but I think it is not purely uh, the user's responsibility. Of course, um, the media, social media platforms uh, have their own responsibility, the regulators and, and so on. Uh, so what do you think? Uh, how is it possible uh, to, to reduce the harmful effects uh, of these platforms? And, uh, and what is the role of the human resources, uh, the artificial intelligence, uh, and, and whose responsibility is to, to solve this kind of problems? Uh, I don't know who wants to start it. Yeah, maybe I... I... I mean, building on what uh, Jamie and George said, and of course, I, I, I agree by default with George <laughs> in, uh, in, uh, 
you know, uh, you know, the debate on this and clearly uh, this is not uh, black and white, you know, we cannot say one is positive or negative. Uh, but I just wanted before to answer your question, uh, uh, I mean, uh, linking to what Jamie said about, uh, you know, the, 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 the fact that we, you know, when we designed the, the systems, we, we or still now the policies, we think, uh, you know, uh, human beings and uh, citizens are rational, no? But this is, you know, now known by, by 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 the facts and also um, the, that this is not the reality. So uh, if you remember the many years ago already the the book of uh, Richard Taylor on Taylor on uh, Nudge, uh, you see that uh, you know we are not. I mean we are making policies like we were all a Doctor Spock or Star Trek, but in reality we, there's a lot of Bart and Homer Simpson. So this is the actually the people that react not let's say uh, i mean looking at the short term uh, uh, benefit they could have and not really at the collective uh, good of society so this is the reality and that's why i mean i fully agree on the fact that uh, actually i'm even more radical in the sense that we should really redesign our institutional systems because there are fundamental flaws in the way our democracies and our governments are uh, still working i mean we are using systems uh, of uh, weberian uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, heritage to try to to manage a, a world that has completely changed. And the educational system, as was pointed by colleagues, uh, is fundamental. We are still uh, uh, educating uh, our children in a way that um, is not giving the skills and the, and the competencies for the for the digital world. So this really need to to be changed. But on the other side, we cannot also. Uh, I mean, uh, 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 we have to be. Of course, uh, the, the private sector is not evil, but uh, uh, clearly we can not be complacent on the fact that there is a, uh, uh, there are risks and it's not their role to manage these risks. It's not Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos to, to regulate the digital world. So is the policymakers, are the policymakers that need to uh, take the uh, responsibility. And that's why, that's where, I mean, I don't want to, <laughs> but I think uh, Europe is trying to uh, take this leadership role that is really needed. That's why the package that was uh, pro proposed in April uh, is uh, uh, going in that direction with the regulatory framework that uh, uh, really try to address, address uh, the risk-based uh, approach that is needed in this, because it's true that we don't know exactly what are the algorithms, uh, what are the, uh, you know, what are the effects of artificial intelligence, and this is uh, something we need to better understand. And citizens clearly are not the one that should decide by themselves on this. So regulators need to to play a role, uh, and I would also go farther because the media should uh, also be involved in that. And this is where, in some countries, I'm Italian, and I can tell <laughs> this is a, a problem. Them, and, but in many other countries, the traditional media are lacking behind. There's, as uh, Bill Dutton wrote in a nice book a few years ago, there's a fourth state that is exactly the social media and, uh, and you know, the digital uh, communities that are uh, raising uh, a lot of challenges, but also could be turned into a positive way of informing citizens. But of course, if this is not manipulated, and if we can uh, really address uh, the uh, disinformation uh, uh, problem, that this is still uh, there. So this brings me to another point uh, that we can discuss later, is also the way we design the technology themselves. Uh, uh, you mentioned artificial intelligence. We can then, uh, I mean, as I said, uh, I'm leading this initiative that was launched uh, um, the day before yesterday, exactly to try to uh, um, build a coalition of uh, like-minded countries across the world, uh, trying to, um, you know, uh, share and try to uh, agree on what are our common uh, shared values, how we can respect fundamental rights and democracy. So uh, this is something that we now probably have they're also, uh, I mean, I jump on a different topic after the results of what we've seen in Afghanistan after 20 years, uh, we probably need to, to think uh, uh, better to avoid that in 20 years from now, we will be in the same situation also when it comes to digital governance. And then maybe in the third round, we can go into this perhaps. Thank, thank you, uh, Jamie. Yeah, again, I'll, I'll try to be to be brief, it's, it's nice that um, that George admits it's all his fault. So I appreciate at least somebody is um, being honest and taking responsibility. <laughs> the thing is, I we all agree, I think, that it'd be nice to redesign 
social media, but no one really knows how. I mean, how a single country could do it. If the UK government said, good news, citizens, we've created a special UK government supported sponsored social media platform that should all use, the number of users on that platform would be zero. And nobody would trust it. No one would want to use it. It would be the worst social media platform ever invented. And this is the problem. We, we all kind of agree on the problem. We don't really know how to solve the problem. But there's a couple of things that I think probably are worth trying. And it comes more about reforming our institutions maybe than the social media platforms because you, it's gonna be very hard to do that. And the first one is, in my mind, every single election uh, uh, paid for advert, for example, the Cambridge Analytica Facebook example in the US, which I covered in great detail for the BBC. I went to California to cover that story, so I know it very well. The fundamental problem was there were just no rules governing that. But if you made every single social media advert during an election had to be published independently so that journalists and others could see them and see what was being shown to citizens, including who was targeted, not individuals, but which groups were targeted with which different micro targeted messaging, you would at least be able to feel like election law was keeping up with the way elections are now being run. And I don't think that's impossible. And another example would be specifically on education, what would we change? What would we include in a curriculum that we don't currently? And I think you don't need to force teachers to be computer scientists to teach the basics of social media business models. How, as George correctly said, they're advertising companies. So this is how they work. This is why they want your attention. This is how they keep your attention. This is how they make their money. So you at least understand, for example, the value and significance of your data. Every single young person now goes out into the world and they essentially have the same responsibilities as a professional journalist. They're suddenly subject to libel law and copyright law and they have no idea what this means. We can teach them the basics of all of this. And also, there is no more powerful algorithm than the human psychology, the kind of our own cognitive biases. Google's algorithms are powerful, but our desire to only find things we agree with and share them with like-minded people and discard the information we don't like is far more powerful than anything Google can do. This is human psychology we teach, not just how the business model works or why data is important. And this stuff is really important, not just because young people need to be equipped with that, but because hopefully those young people can teach us old people what's going on. Because let's be honest about it, it's the older generation that are often the worst at this, that are the most liable to believe anything on social media, to share. Everyone's had their uncle and aunts. Have you read this about the coronavirus that they share on Facebook? It's not 18 year olds sending that, it's my aunt that's sending that stuff around. So we can't teach those people, but maybe if we teach young people, then they can teach the, the older people about it. That these are very small and simple things, but we don't seem really to be doing any of it. And so I think if we at least can try to start, it will create the culture that, you know what, we can solve these problems. We can do something about it. Thank you. So there is one. There is one topic that has been raised yesterday a lot at this conference, and which, which I think we cannot ignore. Actually, it's one of the most fundamental problems of our times, uh, which is that we are living in a, in a trust deficit environment. Uh, we are lacking trust, and there is a lot of research in that regard in our institutions, in each other, in, in certain status roles, in, in expertise in general. And I think that the current versions of social media are either designed to exploit that as the more, neg more negative uh, approach to it uh, and exploiting our biases and uh, sowing the division. Uh, the other one is that they just don't care and they, they, they let us being evil and not just evil or confused and, and hopeless and untrusting. And I think that whatever is attacking the problem, the many facets of the current setup of social media has to be built on trust, like inciting trust. 
because otherwise I, I truly believe that our democracies will, will fail. And I will, I will go even one step further than, you know, there's a lot of talk in the media and most politicians are saying that multiple times a day is um, that political tribalism is a byproduct or at least that it has been accelerated by, you know, heavy social media usage and, uh, and advertising on social media, targeted advertising. I think that the, the real risk in a society is actually going one step further than that, which is the complete fragmentation of society, not just, you know, two tribes against each other, but actually us becoming solipsistic, our, our, us becoming rudderless individuals, because our information, our personalized stream on social media is not overlapping with anybody else's on social media. Therefore, the, the cohesion between person to person and the, the, the types of information and convictions that we share uh, will not be able to overlap that much. Uh, and further social media, media usage is actually, it has been proven by multiple research actually, it's actually reducing our capacity to overcome our differences. Meaning that if you and your friend have, let's say 30% of opinion differences at the, at the, as the whole, you will more and more look at each other as enemies and not friends anymore. And I think that's, that's super, super uh, important. Now, the problem is being attacked from two sides. One is the usual po policy and regulatory aspects. And I don't think that these kinds of efforts should cease. <laughs> Actually, they should start because there's a lot of talk and there's not a lot happening. There are significant bottom-up uh, initiatives that I've seen in the world. I've been actually working on, on one policy proposal package about a year and a half or two years ago with the Club de Madrid, uh, which took a pretty extended uh, view on, on policy reforms, uh, not just including you know, your, actual, your, your everyday or garden variety regulation processes, but a lot of like, uh, let's say bottom-up initiatives for social media uh, to regulate itself similarly to the media councils that are that are present in in certain certain states, uh, or actually elevating the responsibility of social media practitioners, especially algorithmic social media practitioners, to the level of uh, what the lawyers and the doctors uh, have to meet in the U.S. So basically, licensing type orientation. So that's a package, you can read it, I don't want to dive deep into it. But I think that even more energy uh, and more conscious energy should be um, devoted to, to the redesigning of these platforms. And, I, and I, when I'm saying that, that we should go back to the drawing board, I'm not saying that we should massage the current social media problem. Uh, because we are at a conference for cities I would be as radical and say that we should the, the, the model that we should follow is the you know the Greek agora or the Forum Romanum in in, in Rome, uh, and three things: social media in the city context, in the community context, in the in the smallest possible uh, size of a community that can act each other as the forum to discuss our common causes and and our common problems. So you don't necessarily have to. When, you, when you're thinking about social media, you automatically enter this fallacy that you have to create the next big platform that is not named as Facebook, but it has to have 2 billion users. No, it doesn't have to have 2 billion users, actually. If you're thinking about like going bottom up and you know, not designing a social media company, but designing a tool with very positive objectives, consciously determined objectives, on creating consensus and actually I just wanted to refer back to to the Taiwanese the Taipei city deputy mayor I see a lot of good things coming out of Taipei and I and I actually wanted to hear a lot more about those on video but they are orchestrating public opinion for consensus it can be done it can be done it, you, they are uh, they are they are orchestrating you know social media listening and public opinion and natural language analysis to actual action, delivering projects that are, that are you know, empowered by citizens and so on and so forth. So there are models in the world, they are fragmented. I think that the regulatory aspects are 
taken our attention a little bit farther from the from the root of the problem. But I think that cities and governments have a crucial role to, to play in funding the creation of public interest technologies. I think that category should be born in everyone's mind that technology should serve a public purpose. And currently, whatever we have is small and fragmented, and it needs to come together. Thanks. Uh, and I have a somehow related uh, question or, or topic. Uh, as you know, there are a lot of mayors uh, here uh, on this conference, and it is partly uh, organized by uh, Budapest uh, municipality. So I think it is absolutely relevant question. Uh, the social media uh, are absolutely perfect uh, for community building, and uh, we know that it is uh, it is a big advantage uh, of these platforms. Uh, but on the one hand, on, on the other hand, uh, if uh, if mayors and municipalities uh, start uh, using social media for community building, it will be a kind of top-down model, uh, so it is more just a simple PR or, in worst case, a kind of propaganda. But is it not controversial to, to talk about community building and at the same time uh, that how politicians can, can use it uh, in an effective way? May I react first in this round, guys? So. I think you know mayors are using it for PR because they have to. <laughs> their you know their competition is using it. That, that's the logic in in many of the the aspects uh, that we are experiencing all across you know artificial intelligence and the the race for domination uh, in in AI. So you're doing it because your enemies are doing it. Your your opponents are doing it. Uh, I think what is not being done right now is this kind of rethinking the the model of of how you're going beyond pure social media or conversation to actual community building to actual action and that, that some of the examples that that you know i've seen in taipei that i've been studying relatively extensively are are very good in that regard that because they are they're thinking about conversation or inciting conversation orchestrating conversation for cohesion and consensus to action in one single stream the problem is that if you're using only social media, it stops at the conversation level or the maybe the inciting a riot uh, <laughs> level. Uh, so you can take, you know, 15 people out on the street to to bring down a statue in California. But that that is the maximum that you can you can do. So I don't think it's controversial because every politician has to use, uh, you know, ev every legal tool uh, to uh, to create a connection with their voters. But I see very little innovation across the world in rethinking these platforms uh, or creating new types of models. And whenever I see a few very good examples, they are not being replicated. And I think that that's, that's another huge problem, especially here in Europe, that, that the, the system of, of how innovation is being supported and funded uh, is not orchestrated for replication or easy replication. And that's why I was happy yesterday to hear about, you know, new city networks bringing into life when when these kinds of, um, you know, projects can be more successfully um, uh, cross pollinated. So, yes, we need we need dedicated innovation spaces that we need. Uh, we need sandboxes. We need uh, we need to dedicate at least, you know, 10, 20, uh, 10, 20 percent of our innovation efforts in creating these kinds of new public interest technologies that are product by families composed for the public good or the public interest. Thanks. Um, Jamie or um, Gianluca, who wants to comment it? Um, politicians obviously go where the people are, don't they? So they end up on the same platforms that all of us spend our time on. and. I, I, I like a lot of what George is saying, and, I, and I've, I've also looked at Taiwan and, and, and Audrey Tang and, you know, the, some of the brilliant stuff that they're doing. And I totally agree that, I mean, she's an exceptional politician, as very unusual compared to most politicians in Europe, frankly, with her background and, and everything. So there's, a, there's an interesting question about how far we could replicate and, and, and copy. And George will know more than me about that. 
I think the win for politics in particular is is just finding smarter ways of allowing people who are now kind of digital citizens to contribute to policy making, to understanding how laws are being form, formulated, to being more engaged in that whole process, simultaneously to just trying to do things around the outside of these big social media platforms. I agree, we can't start another one. We can't try and create new platforms. We can introduce some of the ideas and technologies into existing ways that decisions are made. And that's where we're rubbish. And we're just not trying, we, you know, we don't bother. We just create existing Facebook groups or put Twitter accounts up and it's, it's rubbish and it's stupid. There is, however, I think an inevitability about, about sort of community building that we've got to understand. We have this image that if we build these wonderful uh, platforms, the good guys will all turn up and use them. But the reality is that the, the people who we think maybe are the bad guys are just as good at creating communities as we're probably better because they're more motivated. They hate the mainstream. They're early adopters of all technologies. So who was the first group in the UK that really understood the power of using Facebook to create a community and mobilize around a common cause? It was the far right English Defence League way before anybody else. And so we've always, I think, got to remember that we, when we try to build these interesting new technologies, don't assume it's all our, our kind of people turning up and all the educated professors. Are going, it's, it's not, it's never that. So we've always got to bear in mind this kind of what happens with community building as well. It's not always turns out the way we expect, but we have to live with that. That's what a democracy is as well. It's sometimes people you disagree with getting together to common under a common cause. So there is one other problem, of course, about the trying to fundamentally change the big platforms. We, I, think they, I think there is a tendency towards one or two very large ones that's very hard to get around just because of basic network effects. More people on the platform, better content, better, better uh, uh, technology that gives you better content leads to more people joining. And so it goes and goes and goes and goes. And I, and I, I think it's kind of almost a fundamental the network effect is a fundamental rule of technology and of social media. We're never going to get around that. So we're always going to have to live with these very, very big, very, very powerful, relatively small number of platforms alongside some of the stuff that George is talking about as well. So rather than seeing them necessarily in opposition, you just got to see where you can have them living together naturally and easily. Thanks. Uh, Gianluca, do you want to comment? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, well, let, let me uh, I mean, elaborate on uh, what uh, George uh, said about, and of course, this this conference is, uh, I mean, focusing on the city level, and uh, so. And I, I've been, uh, I mean, uh, advocating for for the fact that we need to involve more the the, the local governments and the cities, uh, uh, also in the European. Uh, let's say, uh, policy and uh, 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 development and this, uh, I mean, since many years, and this is now actually uh, one of the key focus in many also in many policy and funding instruments of the Commission and of the EU. Uh, but also, uh, and because it's at the city level that, uh, you know, there is the, uh, the relation between the, 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 the governments and the, and the citizens and many also public services are, are delivered. So, uh, but on the other side, we have seen also um, a movement uh, sometime, uh, I would say, kind, kind of wishful thinking or rhetorical about, the fact, you know, you move from, you know, it was in government, in participation, in democracy, smart cities, you know, use of technology that is going to change this uh, relationship, but in reality, it didn't uh, necessarily do so. And now there's a new wave with the AI, uh, big data, the digital twins, the social innovation, cooperation, you name that. So the, while this is necessarily uh, the, the focus to, to, to have, on the other side, we have to be careful also not replicating the, the same, uh, uh, let's say, um, failure that we have seen also in other uh, contexts. Uh, I mean, Jamie was mentioning before, of course, uh, many government attempted, and UK, as it was a pioneer in, in the digital world, as all 
often be often the, the one that failed first. So uh, the, having uh, having uh, you know a platform uh, for uh, for uh, the social media of the government uh, that didn't work. And this is all the petitions of these things worked a bit, but didn't really change things. Uh, so now we know that, or we should know that, and so we should take advantage of, of this and uh, uh, learn some of the lessons. Um, and clearly. Um, but we see still today, and this, I don't want to make promotion of this, but, uh, uh, but uh, I'm also uh, the director of a master on AI for public services. We had, I mean, we received a, a lot of interest, uh, uh, overwhelming uh, uh, attention because we, we found uh, a niche where, uh, you know, in the, civil, in the public sector, uh, people want to understand the technology and how to use it. So the need of functional specialists is so important. And this is what is missing. We have education courses that uh, tend to, to learn, to, to teach uh, how to use the technology, but not how to uh, use the technology for specific uh, purposes. So the issue of public purpose that George said is very important, both at the design of the policy and the, at the service delivery level. Now, in that sense, uh, um, and it is true that uh, while it is true that it is at the local level that uh, you know things need to be addressed, uh, and then uh, I mean Europe is a small region altogether. So uh, if we only uh, look at Italy, there we have uh, eight thousand cities, uh, municipalities. So clearly. Uh, there must be also a level uh, higher that uh, coordinate uh, and uh, support this. Uh, of course, I'm, uh, I've always been uh, in favor of the EU, so clearly the European Union has tried and is trying uh, now still to promote this. Uh, yesterday there was the State of the Union speech of President uh, von der Leyen, uh, where there is actually an attempt to boost this uh, uh, role of uh, promoting the, the you know the European values uh, and the, in the technology uh, development uh, and, and here uh, without entering into the detail will be boring but all the, the, the you know all the proposal of um, regulations and uh, and incentives and um, policy that has been done uh, in from this commission that need to be uh, further developed uh, are going in that direction and to, to simplify on one side that we have uh, uh, to build uh, still and reinforce uh, what is the ecosystem of, uh, of excellence that we have in Europe in terms of research and funding uh, uh, for developing technology, but sometimes uh, not being uh, able to uh, bridge the gap uh, between research and practice and, and policy as well. On the other side, we need to invest on the ecosystem of trust. That is what exactly George said at the beginning, how we build this trust that actually and most of the, I mean, the Edelman report uh, that comes out every year in January shows that this is actually uh, declining the trust of the citizens on the institutions, both the private sector, public sector, and the media. So this is something we need to address. And how can we do that? Uh, again, uh, um, George mentioned that we need to experiment. So the sandbox uh, and uh, uh, let's say experimental policy could be one uh, part of the solution. And on the other side, we also need to have more evidence to see what really works and what are the, the positive and negative effects of certain uh, policy intervention. So, um, and that's also something where um, we, I mean, the policymaker should admit that they are, they are ignorant, they don't know, <laughs> and so they should also uh, try and test uh, uh, what to do, uh, and this especially at the city level. So a lot of initiatives, and I won't name them, are going that direction, trying to exactly cross-fertilize uh, uh, between cities, uh, peer learning uh, exercises, and, uh, and uh, really understanding together what needs to be done. Thank you. Uh, and at this point, uh, I would like to open the discussion to the audience. Uh, so if you have any question, please feel free to ask. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Peter Rosenberg. I work for the mayor. And uh, I would very much like to, to hear more uh, more about how to imagine this new kind of social media that serves a public purpose. Uh, I, I'm having simply a hard time imagining this. And uh, well, if you if you could add some details to the picture, that would be wonderful. Thanks. 
Well, I wish I had it ready for you as a product, but I don't. No, the, the idea behind is, is something like a very conscious exploration of what is wrong in the current models and attacking these you know, faults one by one. So just give you an example, uh, much, much along the lines that, that Gianluca has been talking about. It needs to be something that is designed in a very ethical manner to instill trust in citizens, in creating new connections between you know, citizens and their leaders and their elected leaders that is orchestrated for trust, orchestrated for expertise. So basically fixing a lot of the problems that we have at the societal level right now uh, and not lacking any kind of other, you know, business driven logic to, to overrule the necessities of, of society right now. So it, of course, you know, we don't have it actually. Uh, I think I published the outlines of how it should look uh, about a year ago. Uh, so this is not my own cause, actually. I'm, I'm working with a number of people uh, across the world uh, on, uh, on, on fixing this. Uh, and we are thinking about not just, you know, social media, new kinds of social media platforms, but a product family that is public interest technology. And it does not have the same kind of business objectives as, as a social media platform. As I said before, the aim is not to create, you know, a new social media giant or, or not even a company. But I think that cities and, and countries have a very significant role to play in, in supporting these kinds of technologies, not necessarily solving the problems themselves, but facilitating the spread of these tools in society and making sure that it is always in line with the, the values and the objectives uh, of society. So I'm currently actually pretty hopeful that we can overcome this problem of like always thinking when we are thinking social media, we are always thinking Twitter or Facebook or Instagram and um, and redesign it consciously. It needs it needs a very different mentality than what drives politics right now or even even a municipality. It needs the, the logic of technology. It needs the logic of, of uh, startups. Uh, these these two ways of thinking have to come together on the on the same platform. There is another question. Yeah. Uh, it relates to the, the, the potential. My name is Karl Mandaji. Uh, the, the potential new platform or or social media. I work for the unit social media unit of the European Commission, the so DG Connect. And I uh, experienced uh, at the beginning of uh, of the com uh, COVID crisis and in before that, uh, even before, so that uh, there are, there were, and I think there are needs uh, for a new European uh, platform or social media in certain segment and not uh, insignificant segment of the economy. In particular, the traditional media. I remember well that uh, uh, the representative of the tra traditional media came to us and 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 complained that uh, and it's well known that uh, Google and, and Facebook and so on uh, take the money and the advertisement money and the social uh, the traditional media creates the content. So they they don't get the, the remuneration for their work. And then one point was, please support a new European platform where the rules are different, more uh, fair, and uh, can provide a remuneration for the traditional media, for the content providers, con uh, content creators. Uh, the Commission, I mean, there was internal discussion with the, uh, within the Commission and with the Parliament, and the Parliament supported also. So there was a, at the time when, when there was an idea that to put together money to support a, 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 a new platform, but the, the, the EU, so the Commission doesn't want or didn't want to be the leader. Private business should do it, we give the support, but the private business should do the, the job. And nothing happened. 
So there is need in certain segments of the economy. And I think the pandemic showed that not only in the economy, but the education. So if the education has to shift to an online uh, practice, then uh, uh, we need, in, uh, and, uh, and the education is, is, is getting, uh, if I may say, global or globalized, Europeanized. Uh, if one uh, country or, or uh, publishers can produce a good online teaching uh, material, book or whatever else, video, or, I mean, nowadays it's easy to, to translate into other uh, languages. So if we create a European platform, we can uh, facilitate the, uh, the online education and the health system, the, the tourism. So if, if a tourist is uh, get ill somewhere in another country and uh, his or her files are in, a, in a, another country. So, and then, uh, so I think the platform, the need for a new platform, European platform will be on the table. Maybe today it's not as strong, I mean, uh, not strong enough the demand to, to create, but soon, sooner or later it will be. Can I briefly uh, react to that and then I wanna give and one more point. Oh, sure. Just a different one. But sure. uh, uh, you mentioned the, the Hungarian figures. I want to make a little publicity. The Commission has a, a regular uh, table, statistical table, the DAIS index, digital economy and, and social index. I can pro uh, I shall suggest to everyone to look at it regularly. It's a good, in, a good sign of so a good uh, table what, uh, what uh, Europe has done and has done. It has negative features also or, la or lacks information, but uh, we have to rely uh, on the available time series. If, if something is missing and not for the whole uh, commission, I mean, community, then it cannot be included. So just a short comment to that. I think that the Commission was very wise in that regard, that they did not want to create a single European social media platform. They would fail at that. So I would, I would very much agree with Jamie's previous statements of like, if a government designs a social media platform, it will have zero users. Uh, however, industry is certainly not motivated to do that, or, you know, it can be outsourced to a small company. Uh, one of the more radical ideas that I've read recently and that infiltrated my mind is uh, is approaching data uh, as a common good and create something one aims at creating something like a data dividend for citizens and and basically a private fund that is kind of a tax kind of a surtax on companies that are benefiting dominantly from the data economy so that are very much dependent on data and they are very much exploiting our data. So I think that that direction may be the right one to create, like creating a government fund and making a deal with those companies that they should create some public interest versions of their products or start a new and create new product families. Because frankly, I don't think that you should approach it from like the single European social media platform. That, that doesn't sound right to me. I think it needs to be a set of services designed for the public good and created in much more of a bottom-up manner and see where it works. It's, it's a certain expertise, you know, user experience, for basically the understanding of why products work on people. That's not a government knowledge. That's, that's, a, that's a knowledge that is solely possessed by tech corporations right now. Time is running, but I ask uh, all online participants if they want to add something to this, uh, to this idea uh, of a European platform. Yes, maybe, I don't know. I, I leave the last word to Jamie perhaps, but, uh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, you want to interview first? <laughs> oh, okay. So now, because this is uh, actually, I, I also like the, the question from Peter before that uh, I think is something we should all uh, think about because uh, we don't have the solution, as uh, George said, but we are, let's say, part of the problem and uh, uh, of the solution. So we really need to, to address uh, that, how we want to, I mean, what kind of future we imagine uh, we want to leave to our children and the children of our children. So um, and that's something where uh, the other, the, the comment of the other 
participants uh, brings uh, brings a bell because uh, it is true that uh, uh, let's say in the global world and Europe tried uh, uh, in the global the, 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 let's say the debate uh, Europe tried even to build uh, uh, our own internet and somehow didn't work out. Huh? So, uh, uh, but this is, uh, some, some people are still advocating for that. So, uh, uh, and re there is a lot of research on that. Uh, I mean, like the Chinese are doing basically uh, and others may, may do. So um, I don't think that, and I, I hope nobody really thought of having a social media platform built by the commission. Uh, uh, but <laughs> I mean, there are already a lot of uh, limitations on the communication and the use of technology from the, from the institution. Institutions. But uh, uh, also here, is, uh, we are back to the, the, the first point that was raised before. I mean, we are talking about the digital world and the, the, the institutions that should manage this world. And there's uh, clearly a, a gap. Uh, so I think if we really need, want to address uh, a new, let's say, a landscape for the, for the digital uh, world, uh, we need to redesign our institutions because also there's a confusion often, uh, I mean, at all level, also educated people uh, make confusion between what is the role of the commission and what is the role of the, 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 the council, for instance, and the parliament. So uh, this is also something uh, that needs to be addressed because uh, if we, uh, I mean, Europe, at least we have been successful in a number of issues. One is the internal market. And so we believe on uh, competition, fair competition. And, and this is something that uh, uh, should also be uh, further stressed in Europe and how we want to deal with the world. Uh, and that's why, of course, we I don't think uh, the, the, the EU can uh, fund a big, uh, uh, let's say, a platform uh, um, with European uh, uh, companies. On the other side, we want to reinforce the role of European industry uh, that is often uh, um, too small compared to, to, let's say, fragmented and not, uh, and not uh, um, let's say, in, in competing with others. So, uh, going back to the other issue, I don't think we, we should, uh, um, I mean, we I mean, we don't need to be naive, of course, but uh, we uh, should uh, promote the European values, as it was mentioned before. And this is also in the way we fund research and also we support industry. And this is because other countries are doing in a much more aggressive way. So we should do that uh, uh, also because uh, uh, we have some uh, red lines that uh, uh, we should make clear that are not uh, overcome. For instance, uh, in the AI regulation, it does need made clear that, uh, for instance, we don't do social credit uh, uh, systems and we don't want that in any part of Europe so we should make clear that and the same for other uh, uh, things of controlling uh, uh, citizens or or, 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 um, or behavior of citizens so I don't go much uh, we don't have much time but I think uh, that uh, uh, when we go uh, to the question of Peter, what kind of future we want to, 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 to see, we should be, um, as in all foresight uh, exercise, we should be aware of the risks, uh, try to anticipate and prevent uh, the, the, the threat, but at the same time, be proactive in promoting the ideal, uh, for instance, the Agora that uh, George said. We want an Agora, a digital Agora, of course, is a place where we can, uh, in a democratic uh, uh, system uh, exchange opinions, critiques, uh, and build uh, on the uh, will of the, of the citizens, making sure that, uh, again, uh, this is not manipulated, uh, citizens are not controlled, uh, and there is no propaganda or uh, bad use of the technology. Uh, just a last note on the fact that uh, you know Europe is now advocating for uh, uh, having a leading role in the next uh, decade, the digital decade. This is, uh, there is a new program has been uh, proposed Posed yesterday, and uh, the digital policy program. Uh, there is a digital euro program. Uh, still, we are uh, in Europe uh, um, lead, uh, leading in the research uh, uh, part in technology. There are some limitations, for instance, in the micro chips uh, industry and others. So we have to fill the gaps. But also, we are, we are, and uh, we should uh, take uh, again the leadership role we had uh, in the international community. Because this has been, uh, um, I mean, we are still the first uh, uh, fund uh, donors uh, worldwide, and uh, uh, clearly this is something where we need to invest more energy. Uh, I think uh, for the good of humanity. I will stop here. Thanks, Jimmy. Okay, quickly. I know we're out of time. 
I suppose the big question for me about a European uh, platform is whether British users are going to even, are we going to be banned? Are we going to be allowed on this platform? What's going on? <laughs> Clearly, the drive behind having a platform ultimately is a desire to better control and better tax these big companies. So do that better rather than trying to create a separate one, because that's what this was really all about. I'll only say one thing. In terms of how governments can stimulate or the European uh, Commission can stimulate businesses that can help this, I would say one way is data portability under GDPR. And I don't want to get too technical about it, but you can very well imagine that the right of citizens to be able to take data from companies, pull it together and then sell it to different companies is potentially revolutionary and can solve maybe a lot of these problems. But what we need is a tertiary industry that can help citizens to do that. Companies that will turn up and say, you can't be bothered to go to every company and get your data back. Sign up with our service. We'll do it for you and take 10% of any money you make. And millions of citizens just signing up to single companies to do it on their behalf in an automated fashion would be a, a very interesting new industry and one that could probably benefit from government funding, seed funding to help that industry grow. And I'd rather look at those kinds of um, efforts rather than trying to recreate platforms. And I think that's where the effort should be. Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, already coffee time uh, here in Budapest, uh, so we have to finish it now. Special thanks uh, to the panelists and uh, to the technical staff because it was uh, rather difficult. And, uh, and thanks to the online and offline audience. Thank you, Indeed, thank you very much.